Video recording for this meeting has begun. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, MicroLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on the promise and pitfalls of index insurance, building resilience through responsible implementation. We're going to have a great discussion today about agricultural and livestock-based index insurance as a development tool and the emerging evidence based, or a base around its e efficacy. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And if you've attended an AgriLinks webinar in the past, you've probably heard my voice. I will be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear me uh, throughout the webinar, especially during our Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. Before we dive into the content, I would just like to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself and to let us know where you're joining from. The chat box is your main way to communicate today, and we encourage you to use it to post questions at any time, to share resources, and to discuss the topic with your colleagues. And I can see that lots of you have already introduced yourselves, which is great. Thank you very much for saying hello. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll try to answer some of them in the chat box along the way, and the rest will hold until after the presentation. You'll see that the slides are available for download in the box on the left of your screen if you'd like to grab a copy now. And they'll also be posted on AgriLinks. And there, we have a couple other uh, recommended resources in the file downloads box for you. And lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional resources once they are ready in about a week or a little more than a week's time. All right, I am going to go ahead and introduce our speakers, and then we can get started with our content today. First up will be Jennifer Sisse, who is the Senior Risk Advisor in USAID's Bureau for Food Security in the Office of Market and Partnership Innovation. Jennifer manages BFS's ins uh, insurance-related activities and provides technical assistance on resilience, risk management, and index insurance and she will frame the conversation with an overview of how index insurance ties into USAID's risk and resilience work. And then next, oh, there's Jennifer. Great. And then next up will be Tara Chu, who is the Assistant Director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Assets and Market Access, based at the University of California, Davis. In this role, she provides both administrative and strategic support for a wide portfolio of research focused around the topics of risk management and resilience, including the I-4 Index Insurance Innovation Initiative. And then we will move to Michael Carter, who is the director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Assets and Market Access and the I-4 Index Insurance Innovation Initiative. He is also a professor of agricultural and resource economics at the University of California, Davis. And among other efforts, his research features a suite of projects that design, pilot, and evaluate index insurance contracts as mechanisms to alleviate chronic poverty. So we've got some really exciting experts on the webinar today, and I'm going to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Jeff. Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, my name, as Julie mentioned, is Jen Cisse. I'm a senior risk advisor in the Bureau for Food Security. Um, as Julie mentioned, I manage our um, centrally funded insurance portfolio out of Washington, D.C., including our work with the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Assets and Market Access. So before we get into the specifics of index insurance, I would like to take a few minutes to frame the conversation by looking at insurance within the broader risk and resilience landscape. Um, so, as I think you all know, the Feed the Future initiative is the U.S. government's global hunger and food security initiative. Um, on this slide, there's a bit of information about the Feed the Future initiative, but um, what you may not remember is that it was launched in 2010 by the U.S. government um, to address global hunger and food insecurity in response to the food price crisis of 2007 and 2008. Um, so this was really an early pre-2011 response to risk and its impact on food security. Um, and the Feed the Future initiative supports uh, 
USAID's innovation labs, including the Assets and Market Access Innovation Lab, um, which is where Kara and Michael are joining us from today. So uh, a little bit after uh, the launch of the first phase of Feed the Future, um, in 2012, um, the global community started working on the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And um, as this came out, this was um, a follow-on to uh, the Hugova framework, um, and uh, it highlighted four priorities for action. Understanding disaster risk, strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk, investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience, and enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and to build back better in recovery, rehabilitation, and, re and reconstruction. So I think it's um, just interesting to think about the international community and the um, disaster risk reduction priorities and how insurance fits into these. So I think insurance specifically touches on the first two of these, understanding disaster risk and strengthening disaster risk governance to manage um, disaster risk. And insurance is a great tool for not only helping um, understand disaster risk, but also communicating that to potential clients. Around the same time, uh, in 2012, in response to the droughts in 2011 and 2012, and our, our experience in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, USAID came out with policy and program guidance on resilience, building resilience to recurrent crises. And you can still find this guidance document online, and I can share it in the chat box later for those who don't have it. Um, but I really wanted to talk about where that brings us today. So currently, um, Feed the Future Resilience and Livelihood Diversification Guidance discusses pathways for managing livelihood risk. So this is kind of some of the current thinking at USAID in terms of um, how households can manage livelihood, livelihood risk and how insurance fits in. So as you can see, um, households who are facing risk may want to diversify their livelihoods to reduce exposure to climate, um, or they may want to buffer their climate risk through climate smart agriculture and accumulation of assets and, and income and through things like insurance. So if you look at um, the different options here that households have when they're thinking about you know, working on their livelihoods. They have the option to move out of agriculture completely, which um, avoids exposure to climate risk potentially by working in non-agricultural livelihoods. They have the option to step out, which is to partly step out of agriculture. But what insurance really can help households do is to step up in agriculture by helping households manage the risks that they face in agriculture and then incentivizing them to invest on farm. Um, so this is really how we're thinking about insurance in, with regards to uh, the global food security strategy. So what are the strategies for managing livelihood, uh, livelihood risk? and how does insurance fit in. Uh, when we talk about risk management, we're really talking about a collection of different types of uh, strategies and approaches. There's risk reduction, risk mitigation, risk coping, and risk transfer. So mitigation is risk avoidance, which is what um, we were just talking about with moving out of agriculture, or perhaps diversifying the livelihood so that part of the livelihood of the household is not in agriculture or agriculture-related um, livelihoods or jobs. Um, we can reduce exposure by focusing on perhaps drought tolerant inputs, irrigation, et cetera, other technologies that may um, reduce the impact of, for example, drought on agriculture. Of course, uh, USAID does a lot of work in helping households cope with risk, and we want to avoid, um, help households avoid negative coping strategies, such as decreasing consumption or um, selling productive assets. So when we talk about financial inclusion, we're really interested in how savings can help households cope with risk. And then we talk about uh, risk transfer, and that's where insurance really comes in. So that's a way of taking advantage of the market, um, and sometimes it's a combination of public and private actors to help households move that risk away from themselves and onto um, for example, an insurance company.
So bringing us back to Feed the Future, we can see how insurance fits into the global food security strategy. Um, I think it's pretty clear that um, index insurance in agriculture really contributes directly to objectives one and two, um, particularly uh, IR5, which has to do with risk management specifically, but also to IRS one and two, because we're hoping that um, through access to insurance, households will invest on farm, increasing their productivity and incomes. Um, but also, insurance can help indirectly contribute to objective three, which is um, a well-nourished population, by reducing negative coping strategies, such as decrease in consumption. So just to sum up quickly, um, insurance may help households step up in agriculture and increase on-farm on investment. But it is important to point out that insurance is only one component of risk management, and households may still want to mitigate risk by diversifying off-farm into livelihoods with less climate risk exposure. Um, however, the, one of the reasons we're here today is that there has been a lot of excitement in agricultural index insurance, which I think is warranted, but poor quality and unsafe products may actually do more harm than good. So I am now going to turn it over um, to Tara Chu. Um, my contact information is here for those uh, who would like to get in touch um, so that they can delve more into not just some of the benefits, as I just briefly mentioned, of index insurance, but also some of the potential pitfalls and things that we can do to help make sure that insurance products do no harm. Thank you. Hi. So I would like to start by talking about some of the AMA Innovations Lab research on insurance today. And we've done a lot of work designing, piloting, and testing agricultural index insurance around the world and built a pretty good evidence base for its potential impact as well as potential pitfalls. The way we think about the role of agricultural index insurance is linked to the way we view risk. With decades of evidence around risk and development have indicated that risk makes people poor when a shock occurs by reducing their incomes and destroying their assets, but in addition, it keeps people poor by discouraging investment and distorting patterns of asset accumulation. And this is something Jen already referred to, but by protecting households against the worst consequences of adverse shocks, index insurance should not only prevent households from using these costly coping mechanisms, such as selling out remaining assets, reducing consumption, pulling children out of school, but it should also allow households to invest more in risky but potentially high returning activities. So this is a way in which we see agricultural index insurance playing a role to both accelerate and then protect economic growth for smallholder farmers. So first, when we look at the evidence about coping after a shock, after a drought occurs, um, we found that, and this is based on evidence from uh, index-based livestock insurance for pastoralists in northern Kenya, we found that for relatively poorer households, they tend to reduce consumption rather than selling off their remaining assets when a shock occurs, which can lead to really long-term negative, negative impacts, such as sending of children under five, which in turn can lead to the intergenerational transfer of poverty. We found for these types of households, poor, the relatively poor insured households reduced use of this strategy by roughly 62%. And then for those households that are relatively well off, they may sell off remaining assets to smooth their consumption. This can place households in a poverty trap if they no longer have the minimum assets needed to maintain their livelihoods in future years. For these households, they reduce use of distressed asset sales by 70%. But we've also found good results, positive results, before, or after, before the drought occurs. For example, in an impact evaluation of index-based insurance in Mali for cotton farmers, farmers, even before anything occurred, by the confidence that insurance gave them, increased the area cultivated, increased use of loans for investments, and in increased their productive investments. In Ghana, looking at credit access and inclusive access to credit, index, an index interlinked with credit, in, an index insurance linked with credit found that it induced women to increase their loan applications by roughly 15 to 17 percent. And when it's designed in such a way that the payouts go first to repay the balance of the loan and then the surplus to the, the borrower, the insured individual, that increased loan approval rates by the bank 32 percent. So we've seen promising 
results both before and after the drought. But quality matters, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Not all contracts work the way that we envision that they should in terms of providing reliable protection against drought. So looking at this graph, the blue marks that you see um, intersect at the money paid out by the government subsidized index insurance as a, and then against the, and the proportion of the estimated loss against the area-wide average yield as a percentage of average historical yield in that area over, I think it is, this was over an eight-year period. So the red line is the average, the, the red line you see running horizontally is the average of those individual payments. And so basically what this is showing is that the average payments was roughly the same whether the farmers on average suffered a total crop loss or had a crop loss that was double the historical average. That didn't really work well in terms of being able to reduce the negative costly coping mechanisms we see, both in terms of after a drought occurs and in terms of missing opportunities before a drought occurs. So the stakes are high here. When an index insurance contract fails, a farmer may be left worse off than she would have been without insurance. She'll have not lost not only her crop, but the money she spent on the insurance premium. She may be forced to default on any loan she took as a result of having the confidence the insurance gave her. And then in the end, she may have to resort to the, historic, the, the, the negative coping mechanisms we've seen in the past, such as asset sales, meal reduction, or withdrawing children from school. Um, further, in the bigger picture, these failures sow distrust for an otherwise promising tool and by sabotaging the impacts that are possible with high quality contracts. So with that, I'd like to pass it off to Michael um, to uh, go in greater depth about how we might recognize whether or not an insurance product is or is not quality and how we can work to build stronger products in general. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Tara, and good morning, afternoon, and evening to, uh, to everybody wherever you might be. So what I would like to do is talk a little bit about quality standards, uh, why they matter, and how we might design contracts uh, to meet those quality standards. So Tara's already given, given us a nice introduction on some of the impacts that index insurance can have, uh, helping farmers move up, as, as Jen put it in, in her comments. Um, so while the evidence uh, such as that summarized by Tara is very promising. There are also uh, some fairly uh, spectacular instances of index insurance uh, failure uh, that have occurred. I think it was an article in The Economist not too long ago that said there, there should be malpractice for index insurance. So I think we need to take these uh, quality concerns uh, quite seriously. So what I'm going to talk to you about uh, initially is trying to conceptualize and think about and, and actually measure index insurance quality. So in very simple terms, when we say a quality index insurance, we mean one that adequately protects farmers against income fluctuations. And if it does that, then we might anticipate, uh, we might anticipate that uh, actually offering agricultural insurance will achieve some of the development objectives that we're looking for. So let's jump right in and kind of think about this. So I've been talking about this for a while, and I'm going to try some stuff out on, uh, try some ideas out and ways of presenting this that I, that I hope will, uh, will resonate uh, with all of us. So I think the best way to start thinking about index insurance quality is to recognize that quality of an index insurance contract is, a, is what might be called a hidden trait. So, there's a picture there on your screen. This is a woman in Marsabit in uh, northern Kenya. She's very proudly holding uh, an index insurance contract, which she purchased as part of the index-based livestock insurance uh, project there in that part of the, the world. Uh, and she's holding that contract, but whether that contract is reliable or not, she can't tell by looking at that piece of paper. The paper's nicely printed, and it has all sorts of uh, indecipherable, probably, uh, things on it. Uh, but, but she can't tell by just looking at the contract uh, with it. And the problem, of course, is part of the problem is that uh, not only is 
the quality of an index insurance contract not immediately visible to the consumer, creating a quality contract is at least somewhat more costly uh, than creating a low quality kind of contract. Now, the hidden trait problem of index insurance is certainly not unique. If we think about, if we think about maize seeds, for example, uh, holding a maize seed in your hand, uh, you can't tell whether that's a hybrid seed that's going to give you four tons per hectare or whether it's a lower quality seed. You can't tell whether that seed is a little old and may not germinate. And so <clears throat> when we think about things like hybrid seeds, just about every country that I know about has at least some effort to, to certify seed quality precisely because it's an index insurance. And, and governments want farmers to have the confidence that if they pay good money for something with a hidden trait, that the trait is actually there and, uh, and will, not fail, will not fail the farmer. So we have sort of a, we have an analog, uh, we have an analog issue in insurance. But there's been a little bit of work done in, in my domain of economics suggesting that when you have this problem of hidden trait in the context of insurance, an unregulated market or a market that doesn't have any quality externally, external quality standards in it can reach what you might call a junk insurance equilibrium. That is, the low quality insurance contracts will drive out any good quality insurance contract. And in the end, the demand for the insurance ends up being low and the kinds of things we hope insurance can allow and enable farmers to do, in fact, uh, may, may not happen. So in a sense, uh, to, to use kind of economistic language, there's a public good case for certifying index insurance quality, either through public regulatory authorities, which is what we typically see in the case of maize seeds, or we could also think about uh, a, a, an industry-sponsored but independent private lab that uh, certifies quality. So a good example, uh, in many parts, certainly in the U.S. and many other places I've been, we might see electrical appliances that have a little sticker on them that say UL for underwriter labs. I think it's interesting to think about the history of that. The underwriter labs was actually formed uh, uh, at the time of the Chicago World's Fair in about 1900, and the electrical devices were quite novel at that time. Uh, and there was concern that the, these new devices might actually start fires, which they in fact will, as many of you know, uh, if if the device is not well uh, is not well designed, uh, if the gauge of the wire being used to carry power to the device is is not heavy duty enough for the the power that's being pulled through. And Underwriter Labs was formed to certify that uh, these devices were safe. And it's an independent organization, and 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 that's uh, supported by industry contributions. And in the case of Chicago, it was actually the insurance industry that was insuring the Chicago World Fair against fires and things like that and all the buildings that had been built that the insurance companies actually insisted that any electrical device that went into the World's Fair actually have the UL seal of approval. Otherwise, they weren't going to insure the World Fair against this. So it's kind of a nice example of the private sector on its own. Uh, insisting on and enforcing rules uh, for for quality standards. So I think when we come to insurance, it, it's, it's fairly easy to understand the danger of an unregulated or lack of quality standard uh, of, of a, a, an electrical appliance. I think insurance is a little more complex. Uh, Tara showed us a picture that showed that a, a suite of rainfall-based uh, index insurance contracts in India tended to pay off almost as frequently when conditions were good, when conditions are bad. And what I, I want to try to, I'm going to use a simple example, and this is my novel effort here to communicate these ideas. I want to use a simple example to try to show why, uh, why we think this is, why this is so important uh, of an issue. So we're going to make a real, I, I, uh, I'm going to make a real as simple an example as we can uh, that just uh, tries to draw these issues out. So, and again, I'm an economist, right? So I like to assume uh, lots of things. So let's assume that there's only two kinds of worlds or conditions the farmers can experience. They can have a good year, and let's just say when the good year happens, the farmer earns a thousand dollars from their agricultural activity. And that happens 80% of the time. But the farmer also faces a 20% chance of a bad year. And in those bad years, the farmer earns only $250. And that may not be enough to even pay the bills and, and hence could induce 
uh, the kinds of costly coping strategies that uh, Tara and Jen uh, referred to earlier. So the question uh, is, what does the farmer do? The farmer can go it alone and face this risk that uh, one out of every five years or 20% of the time the bad year happens. Or let's imagine the farmer now has available to it an index insurance contract that comes along and pays the farmer $400 in bad years. So initially, to make it real simple and get the ideas clear, let's assume that this is a perfect uh, insurance contract. And the perfect insurance contract only pays the farmer the $400 uh, in the bad years and never pays out in, in good years. So let's sort of think about what that might look like. Uh, the last couple of points on this slide just sort of make the points we're going to rest of the assumption uh, under this. So notice this insurance contract, what's called the actuarially fair price, is, is $80. So there's a 20% chance of the insurance contract uh, paying out the $400. So the actuarially fair price is 20% times $400 or $80. And let's further assume that that insurance contract uh, gets marked up to cover administrative costs, taxes, marketing, et cetera, it's marked up by 50%. So the cost of this insurance contract is going to be $120. And the question we want to ask ourselves then is, would the farmer be better off going it alone or paying $120 for this insurance uh, contract? And the concept we use and that we've been developing at the Assets and Market Access Innovation uh, uh, Access and Innovation uh, Lab uh, is a minimum quality standard. And the minimum quality standard is just that if the farmer is better off buying the insurance, better off economically buying the insurance than not buying the insurance, then we'll say that the, uh, uh, we'll say that the contract passes the test. I'll come back briefly in a moment to, to note there's a related question which uh, we often talk about in the world of agricultural insurance is, well, what if the government actually pays the insurance? What if the government fully subsidized the insurance? So the related question is, would the, would the household be better off if, if the government bought them the insurance, that is, provided 100% subsidy, or would the household actually be better off if the government just gave them the amount of the subsidy as, a, as an annual cash transfer? So those are the questions we want to answer in this, in this, particular, uh, in this particular question. So here's my simple example. I see somebody already asked about average years. So we could have average years that we just add more bars to the graph, but it's not going to change the basic, uh, the basic story that we have, we have going on here. So the way to understand this, the, the horizontal axis shows the income level of the farmers, and, we, and the height of the bars represents the probability that an event occurs. So when the farmer doesn't have insurance, those are the reddish, orangish bars, whatever colors they appear on, on your screen, the two outer bars. And we can see that 80% of the time, uh, without insurance, the farmer gets, uh, farmer gets the $1,000 income, and then 20% of the time, the farmer gets the lower income. And then what insurance does is, of course, squeezes those two together. So the farmer is paying the $120 insurance premium. And in good years now, the farmer gets the $1,000 less the insurance premium. And in bad years, he gets the farmer pays the insurance premium, uh, but then it's compensated with the $400 uh, payment. And so the farmer's income is, is much less dire uh, in bad years. Okay. Um, now, the average income of household without insurance is going to be $850, but with perfect insurance, average income is actually lower. The average income is going to be $810. And the difference between those two is actually the $40 markup uh, on the insurance. So the first thing to note is anytime you have insurance, it's actually going to be costing the farmer on average money, and that's because the farmer has to pay for the money he receives, he or she receives in bad years and also has to pay for the cost of administration. So the question then is, is this lower average income worth the stabilization effect of insurance? Uh, and so it, it can be if a, if a dollar in a time of stress is effectively worth more than a dollar in a time of plenty. So notice, in this case, the farmer gives up a dollar forty in times of plenty in order to get one dollar in times of stress. And economists have long sort of thought about this problem you know, why would someone pay more than a dollar to get a dollar back? And that's because, in fact, 
money is worth more to us when money is scarce. So when we've had a crop failure and our income is very low, uh, then indeed we might be willing to make this trade off of a little less money in order to have the stabilization effect we saw of moving those two blue bars in or more particularly moving the blue bar in bad state of the world up. So that's sort of the principle of, it, of, of insurance. And then the question is, is whether any particular insurance is, is, has a quality or characteristics which would make farmers want to buy it. So this next graph, I apologize, is a, is a little bit complicated. What we're showing on the horizontal axis is the probability that the contract fails. Uh, and let's just start with the case of perfect failure, uh, a perfect insurance rather. And so perfect insurance is the one when the contract never fails in the bad state of the world. And that's all the way over at the left-hand side where it says contract failure probability is zero. And then what we're graphing here is a measure of the, what, what's called the certain income equivalent of, of different situations as a function of the state of contract failure. So let's look at the, at the red and the, and the blue lines. And what we can see is the green line is, is showing that for the farmer who goes it alone, the average income is $850. But for a farmer who's risk averse, getting that $850 in a random way, sometimes really low, sometimes higher than that, has a risk discounted so-called certainty equivalent of only $730. What the downward sloping uh, red line is showing is what's the certainty equivalent of having an insurance contract. And so if we look at the zero failure rate, we can see the certainty equivalent for a risk averse farmer is well above, it's about, it's about $800 excuse me, it's, it's about $800 for the risk-averse farmer, which is just the way of saying that this perfect insurance contract easily exceeds the, the minimum quality standards. That is, a risk-averse farmer would be more than happy to pay $120 for this insurance, even though it lowers average income. That squeezing together, that lifting up of the bad year is well worth it. So the farmer's happy to give up a little bit of money on average uh, in order in order to achieve this income stabilization effort. Now, that's the case of perfect insurance, but of course we know index insurance is in general not perfect. Now, as, as, as a lot of people have discussed, index insurance can be a great tool because it reduces the administration cost that makes conventional index, uh, makes conventional insurance infeasible for small scale farmers. By conventional insurance, I mean insurance which is loss adjusted such that when the farmer has a loss, he has to call the insurance company. Someone has to go out and inspect the, uh, inspect the plot and verify the loss. But it's Achilles, the Achilles heel of index insurance is that it's the, the way it's saving money on loss adjustment costs is it's not measuring individual farmer yields and losses. It's simply measuring an index that is correlated with the farmer losses, but it's not the same sort of thing. So that raises this, this the fact that index insurance pays on an index rather than on actually looking at what happens to each individual farmer induces two sorts of problems. The first is it can induce a false negative. That is, um, sorry, my phone is suddenly telling me. Uh, um, the the index insurance um, um, the index insurance with a false negative is not paying the farmer even though the farmer had a genuine loss and that's just because of imperfect correlation between the index and what happens to the farmer. Uh, index insurance can also exhibit what's called a uh, can exhibit what's called a false positive, and the false positive happens when the index triggers a payment, but again the farmer's actually not had a loss. Okay, now that might sound like a good thing to get money when you didn't actually have a loss, but it's actually a bad thing because remember, the farmer in this case is paying a dollar forty for every dollar the farmer gets back for insurance. So paying a dollar forty to get a dollar might be a good idea when you've had a loss and money is valuable, but it's actually a very bad thing when you've not had a loss and a dollar is worth uh, just a just a dollar. So let's take these ideas real quickly to our simple example, and we're going to assume to make it real easy that the false negative probability equals the false positive probability. And what we're gonna see is that a risk averse farmer 
will be uh, who would be better off with a perfect insurance would actually be better off going it alone anytime the index insurance uh, contract uh, failure rate becomes too high. So let's try to understand why that why that is. So this is the same graph we've had before, but now I've added in this I've added in these uh, these failure rates, and so we can see again the red bars are what happened to the farm what the farmer faces when uh, when there is no insurance. So there's the high income in in good years, there's the low income in bad years. Now what happens to the farmer when there's the possibility of, of index insurance failure is, is more complicated. And what I really want to focus on is the far blue bar on the left. So the far blue bar is the income the farmer faces in bad years when the farmer has paid the insurance premium, and yet the farmer did not actually receive a payment. So as a, an economist who works on this uh, named Daniel Clark said, and as Tara alluded to, when you have index insurance, uh, contracts that can fail you, the worst thing that can happen actually becomes worse. And we see that in this diagram. So when the farmer doesn't have insurance, the worst thing that happens is the farmer uh, has an income of 250. But when the farmer has an index insurance that can fail him, and it happens 10% of the time in this little numerical uh, example, then the farmer has an income of 250 but paid an insurance premium of eighty uh, of one hundred and twenty dollars, and so the the income of the farmer is even lower uh, than it would have been without the insurance. And this is this is really really important to keep this uh, to keep this thing in mind. And this is why, as we think about index insurance, we need to be very cautious and very wary of of index insurance contracts that fail. So let's then very quickly go back to the same diagram we had before. And what we can see here is now, before we talked about perfect insurance in the bottom two lines showed us that for the risk averse farmer, the overall economic value of having insurance was well above the economic value of not having insurance. But we can see that red line is downward sloping. So that as these failure rates of, of insurance contract goes up, then the certainty equivalent of having index insurance begins to collapse. And indeed we can see we can see that when we get to a failure rate of around uh, just below 50%, we can see the farmer actually would be better off from, from his perspective of household or her perspective of household well-being. The farmer would be better off uh, having no insurance rather ha than having an insurance that fails him and leads him in even worse straits in, in some of the bad states of the world. Uh, so this is, this is, I think, the key issue is that when we pro promote insurance, we need to be very careful because it's actually possible uh, to make people worse off. In the interest of time, I won't say anything more about insurance subsidies, but the, the, the top half of this graph is just showing what happens when you have fully subsidized insurance. And with the farmer, it compares whether the farmer would be better off being given the insurance subsidy as a cash transfer, or would the farmer be better off with the insurance? And we can see that if the insurance of, uh, is of high quality, the farmer would say to the government, I'm better off if you give me free insurance. On the other hand, as the insurance quality collapses, the farmer would actually say, no, I would be better off if you just gave me that money every year rather than giving me an insurance contract that doesn't, uh, doesn't pay off very well. So those are some basic things about the minimum quality standards. So what I'm presenting here is fairly uh, standard uh, economic tools that makes the point in this simple example, and, and we can do this in, in real world examples where there are all kinds of states of the world, good years, average years, bad years, and all sorts of things in between. We have sort of a, a set of conceptual tools that allow us to answer the question of whether or not the farmer would be better off or not with or without insurance. So that's sort of the gloomy part of the presentation. Uh, and and um, uh, e economics is sometimes called the dismal science. So that's the dismal part of the conversation. But the question is, if we have this kind of standard, you know, are there index insurance contracts out there? And what might they look like uh, that could meet this quality standard? So I'm just going to say a very few things so as not to go on uh, 
too too very much long, but let me just uh, rather than stop just on the dismal quality standard, uh, uh, let me let me say just a, a few ideas uh, about about what happens. So, I think it's important to stress that when we talk about contract failure or insurance or risk that's not insured by an index insurance contract, it's important to understand that that uninsured risk is coming from two places. So one of them is what's labeled on the slide idiosyncratic risk. So idiosyncratic risk occurs when the individual's losses differ from the losses experienced by, the, by those around her. So let's think of an insurance zone. An insurance zone is a group of farmers who are geographically proximate to each other, and they're all covered by the same kind of index. So Tara showed us an example of what was happening in India where farmers were insured by a, a, a rainfall measure. So all farmers within a given, uh, and I think it was a district level rainfall index in the case in India, all farmers got paid off or didn't get paid off based on the rainfall levels within that district. So some farmers might have good years while other people's have bad years. I noticed I've seen several people sign in from West Africa. West Africa is famous for a lot of spatial variability. Um, Farmers who may only be a few kilometers from one another, some people get rain because the rainfalls can be very concentrated spatially. Other farmers nearby get no rain and have a, a loss. And so within that, uh, within a small space, you can have high idiosyncratic risk. So idiosyncratic risk is never going to be covered well by index insurance because at best index insurance is going to cover farmers when uh, it's going to cover them for, for average losses within an insurance zone. But there's a second sort of risk, and it's the second sort of risk that, that we can also address with good contract design. That second sort of risk is called here design risk. And design risk occurs when the insurance index is poorly correlated even with average losses in the insurance, in the insurance zone. So, so how do we make good contracts? The first is we can, we can try to minimize design risk by having, uh, by having contracts uh, index uh, contracts that are well correlated with farmer uh, with farmer losses, and I would say a general rule of thumb is as we think about insurance indexes, we should have insurance indexes that are written on output such as plant growth or yield, and not on the single input rainfall. So we've seen a lot of experimentation with rainfall-based index insurance. But notice rainfall is just one of the many inputs that goes into determining whether or not a farmer uh, has losses. So we need that. Uh, in terms of designing the index insurance, uh, excuse me, in terms of designing in index insurance to minimize idiosyncratic risk, here this is, a very, this is a very exciting kind of area where we can begin to take advantage of technological advances that allow us to measure, use remote sensing techniques to measure plant growth remotely not only measure it remotely, but measure it at very, very, very high resolution. So in one of our current projects in the AMA Innovation Lab right now, we're working with uh, three meter by three meter resolution uh, remote sensing measures of plant growth. That's, that's extremely precise, meaning that we could, in principle, come up with a remotely sensed measure of plant growth on each and every, each and every farmer's fields. The second thing that I think can help minimize idiosyncratic risk is not only downscaling the contract, but also being very institutionally creative. We have a, uh, maybe someone can put up a, a link we made to uh, uh, a little brief we wrote up called Two Triggers Are Better Than One. And basically what we've moved to, and, and uh, this will be my last point here, uh, I believe, is we're going to move to, we're moving towards having audit rules so that we have a primary index that's highly reliable. And when, that, when farmers indicate that those, uh, re, even a reliable index will sometimes fail, then farmers can say, okay, your, your, uh, your primary index failed. It says we had yields of, uh, of only 70% of normal. The contract is supposed to trigger when yields are less than 60% of normal. And our yields were 50% of normal. So we want you to come in and investigate. And that's something we're doing right now in a, a dual project in Tanzania and Mozambique, both, where 
we have a reliable remote sensing based primary index for the contract. This picture, which I won't try to explain because it will take too long, shows that the primary index almost always works, but it fails every now and again. So in designing the contract, we've sort of embraced the probability that the contract will sometimes fail farmers. We've created a fail-safe option so farmers have a mechanism to register their complaints or disagreement with the index. We have an audit team that comes in and uses some fancy uh, cement-based ways of quickly estimating uh, crop yields in farmers' fields. And then we've actually priced it into the insurance contract. So we worked with the insurance companies and we said, look, the index says payouts will happen this percentage of times. But we know from having collected from data from farmers that every now and again this high quality, high resolution index will fail. And so we've actually put into the price of the contract the payouts that have to be covered when the audit triggers it, not the primary index. So we think this is a nice example of a, of a responsible contract that's not going to fail farmers any time in a fairly small locality of, of actually two villages. In this case, we bundle them together into an insurance zone. So anytime yields in those two villages are actually below the trigger value, farmers will get paid. That does not completely eliminate the idiosyncratic risk, but at least in, in these areas in Tanzania and Mozambique, these contracts are well worth the money for the farmer, even though there's a, there is a little bit of idiosyncratic risk that is not insured. So to close uh, and, and move back to Tara for just a few more thoughts, um, we, we think getting these uh, quality standards is really important. We think one of the challenges is thinking about how to work with private sector partners such as insurance companies and public sector entities such as insurance regulatory authorities. How do we provide a quality assurance to the marketplace so that farmers can feel good about the insurance contract that they're offered, feel that they are protected, uh, and that the industry then can invest in the extra effort that is required to create a high-quality contract and know that people will be willing to buy it because they recognize that, indeed, it is a, it is a worthy contract that they should take, uh, uh, that they can have confidence in and change their behavior and move up and make those kinds of investments that uh, Jen described to us earlier. So let me pass it back uh, to Tara then if we can. Okay, thank you, Michael, for that context. And I did want to say one of the slides Michael unfortunately had to skip did discuss many of these pricing issues for the audit role that I see a lot of questions popping up about, so perhaps later we can revisit that. What I wanted to build on what Michael said is building a quality contract is the first step in delivering a quality product to clients. So I wanted to just briefly go over, in the interest of time, what the other pieces that are that need to be in place to make sure that index insurance interventions maximize their impact and, at a minimum, do no harm. We have, we've seen in some of our experiences that there are some weaknesses we consistently identify when insurance interventions, even if well designed, are poorly implemented or experience other implementation challenges. For example, a high quality contract may have diminished or absent benefits uh, observed, not necessarily because of the the potential of the product itself, but because of timing misalignment or any kind of other issues that I'll, I'll go into more later. Uh, and because of this, farmers may have to resort to their traditional negative coping strategies just because of a, a, a timing issue in delivering an otherwise good contract. This can also have credit market impacts if late sales weaken the ability for farmers to make increased investment decisions uh, and invest more. Uh, in their land and their productivity, uh, those impacts would not be observed if it's sold too late. Also, if payouts are late, you can lead to things like, again, farmers re resorting to negative costly coping mechanisms, even though insurance should have been there, uh, and loan defaults, et cetera. Um, we also want to talk about, just briefly, these improvements in product design and product the intervention implementation should be kind of examined iteratively throughout the process. Um, and as you learn more about the client, what the client needs, the value chain you're working in, et cetera, tweaks can be made to try to further improve the product such that it serves the client and has high value. One thing that we've, so 
The AME Innovation Lab is collaborating with the ILO's Impact Insurance Facility on a project called the Global Action Network to Advance Index Insurance. And as part of this collaboration, together with the support of EAA consultants, we combined the minimum quality standards Michael has been talking about with an adaptation for agricultural insurance loosely based on the PEACE tool that the Impact Insurance Facility has put out. And through this, we boiled down three categories, three different dimensions of value that we can observe both before a product is in the field, during, and after. And these revolve around design issues, distribution issues, and delivery issues. And I know Sophie's putting a link in the, in the chat box right now, so if you'd like to look at it further, I'm going to skip over it quickly in the interest of time, but I encourage you to take a look at that and let me know if you have any questions. But what this tool essentially does is by each indicator of these 14 different indicators across three dimensions, you can go through the specific criteria for each indicator and decide whether it is a poor score, meaning there's really bad shortcomings that need to be identified and addressed, average scores that meet some minimum standards but really could do more to improve the client value, and strong, which means that you, this indicator fully meets the criteria such that it has high potential to provide value to the client. So as I said, when to use this tool, before the start of an intervention, using this tool can give you an opportunity to identify potential fail points or potential challenges in the implementation prior to it happening. And, and so you might be able to avoid some loss of trust, loss of interest in your product, et cetera, if you use this tool before starting, almost as a checklist to see what you have in place and whether or not it will be sufficient. During an intervention, if you're, especially if you're having challenges or consistent low demand or observing other challenges that you think might be inhibiting the impact of your intervention or the demand for your product, I think it's completely reasonable to do this as a self-assessment during an intervention to try to identify where improvements can be made. And then before scaling to new areas, uh, I think this needs to be done again to make sure that as you scale to new areas, the pieces that may have been in place fantastically in the pilot may need to be carefully analyzed to ensure that you're not losing quality as you're scaling up or intensifying in an area. Um, so overall, the key takeaways is that, that I want to, to review is that agricultural index insurance really is a promising tool with high potential for development impact. But careful planning of all these factors that we have discussed can really avoid some pitfalls that reduce product quality and that may actually do more harm than good. And it is essential to make sure that all of these pieces are in place for design, distribution, and delivery prior to beginning an intervention to maximize your investment and to maximize the benefits that you will see. And with that, I'll pass it back to Julie for some question and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Jen, Tara, and Michael. Uh, and thank you to all of our participants on the webinar who have been sharing resources, asking some really great questions, and providing some interesting comments and responses to other people's questions. We really appreciate that. We've been collecting your questions um, in a little box that the presenters can see. And so we have about half an hour to run through as many of them as we can. Uh, so I'll begin posing the questions to our presenters. Um, and, and we'll see how many we can get through. So there were several questions that came in about failure rates and basis risk. Uh, and so I'll read through a few of them, and we can see if we can answer them a bit as a group. Uh, so Doris Owusu uh, observed that some products, and she noted Ghana as an example, continue to be challenged by basis risk. So can you provide a little bit more on what basis risk is and, and what is being done to address it? And then um, there were also some questions of, uh, just about what researchers uh, and the insurance industry can do to uh, reduce basis risk. So, Michael, would you like to jump in to begin that answer? Um, sure, I'd be happy to do so. And I started to try to answer some of the questions in the box, but it was not an easy thing to do because it kept jumping around. So let me just verbalize here. Uh, so uh, thank you, Doris, for that uh, question. So basis risk is a term that is used somewhat loosely. Uh, and people fight about exactly what it means. So I avoided it and just went to this idea of a contract failure. 
But basis risk basically means risk that's uncovered by an insurance uh, contract. So when I said a, when I talked about a failure rate for insurance, that's just a, to me, was a simpler way uh, to talk about what many people describe as, as basis risk. So I know in Ghana there have been efforts to use uh, rainfall-based insurance. Uh, and, and so that creates a lot of uncovered basis risk or creates what I was calling uh, a relatively high failure of, of contract, uh, 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 relatively high failure rate for an index insurance that's based just solely on a, uh, based on a, a rainfall uh, index. Uh, I think if we all, any of us who are farmers or even who have been gardeners, we know that there are lots of things that go into plant growth besides rainfall. Uh, so most rainfall-based contracts are simply using, typically using an estimate of the rainfall that hit the ground, the total rainfall that hit the ground over a 10-day period. And as we know, uh, it depends on the intensity of that rainfall. It depends on the soil condition when the rainfall hits. It depends on the temperatures. And then there's all sorts of other uh, inputs that come into determining whether or not you get good, good plant growth. So you might starting, you might get uh, good rainfall uh, at the right density, uh, and, but then the, the temperatures are too high, or you might get an insect invasion, et cetera. So I think the way to fix basis risk, and we're talking about doing this <coughs> in Ghana. We've been working with Gaip, the Ghana Agricultural, I think it's on agricultural insurance uh, program about investigating whether or not <clears throat> we can actually reduce basis risk or reduce contract failure rates by moving to remote sensing-based measures of, of plant growth. That is, that's the output that we're interested in ensuring, or it's closer to the output we're interested in ensuring, rather than trying to write a contract just on one of the many, many inputs that determines whether or not farmers have good years or bad years. So again, the question, what do we do to reduce basis risk? What I was suggesting is that, first of all, we need better designed contracts that are much better at predicting average yields. So when, uh, when we've actually, uh, when we've actually implemented the minimum quality standards real farmer data, what we've done is uh, we've collected information from farmers on the ground, uh, historical data from them about what their yields are, and then we're able to look at different indices and design, design indices that actually uh, correlate as, as good as they can with average losses within an insurance zone. So we call that ground truth thing an index. It's not just sort of saying, well, in the abstract, rainfall should matter, so therefore rainfall indices should be a good insurance index. We actually put it to the test with farmers' information, and farmers' information is reflecting not only rainfall patterns, but intensity of rainfall, its intensity of reflecting insect invasions. It's reflecting a lot of the complex biological interactions that go into determining it. And then the other, so as I say, I think there's technological solutions uh, out there that, number one, allow us to uh, allow us to measure plant growth directly, and number two, are very high resolution in the sense I, I gave the example of three meter by three meter resolution. So we can downscale the contracts and effectively make the insurance zones as small as we want to. Again, rainfall, most of the rainfall contracts uh, that are based on satellite uh, estimates of rainfall are based on, I believe, most of, most of it right now is five kilometer by five kilometer estimates, which means every single farmer in a 25 square kilometer area gets payouts based on a single index. And we know if you're in the Sahelian region or, the, or just below the Sahelian region, and if you're in Mali or Burkina, for example, uh, within a 25 square kilometer area, there's a number of farmers that will have had very, very different experiences. So being able to downscale the contract to the level, say, of a village and get an estimate of average yields in the village in a much smaller area is going to eliminate a lot of the basis risk or the contract failure rates. And then finally, what I was talking about with an audit rule, a fail-safe audit rule is meant then as just something that jumps in, even if a high-quality contract uh, uh, doesn't, the, you know, gets it wrong for at the level of, say, of the village, we can still come in and protect those, uh, protect those farmers. Uh, so, so hopefully that gives uh, some clarity on some of those ideas. Thank you, Michael. 
um, I think that you at least partially addressed this question in your response just then, but I wanted to call it out, um, a question from Erin Collins. What methodology is used to choose the appropriate index in different contexts? And can you maybe compartmentalize that piece of your previous answer? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think right now, I think, I think, as I think it was Jen who said, there's a lot of excitement about index insurance. And you know, I personally got interested in it after writing a lot of dismal papers for years saying. Uh, uh, that risk makes people poor, keeps people poor, as, as Tara said, and at some point said, well, okay, enough of that. Is there something to be done about it? So that's the excitement, but it's, it's a new technology. It's a novel technology, and a lot of people have put a lot of time into trying to find solutions. Um, so, when, what, so recognizing that, I, I think it, at this stage of development, until we get just a little bit more experience, and we know what exactly tends to make for a reliable index insurance contract. I think we need to take a little bit of time and do some experimentation. So one project that we did uh, was with, uh, uh, with World Vision in Tanzania in a rice growing area. We collected, uh, at fairly low cost, we collected retrospective yield data from farmers in this rice growing area. We hired a remote sensing specialist uh, to work with us and we used the, a, a huge number of different satellite-based measures to see which one of them actually provided the best insurance value for the farmers. Uh, and you know, we ended up finding the answer to that. And you know, there's, I don't want to get too wonky on this, but there's, there's sort of the question of what the index might be. So NDVI is a commonly used one that we've used in livestock insurance contracts. NDVI is just a measure of the, basically the green reflectance of the earth. That sounds fairly abstract, but if you think about a farmer's field, it goes from brown to green over the course of the growing season. And if you can measure that very precisely, you have something that tells you a lot about what's going on with plant growth. Uh, there's other higher generation, later generation measures uh, that are that that also tell us about plant growth. So you can estimate evapotranspiration. You can measure something called FPAR, fraction of photosynthetically active radiation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's that aspect to it. You can detect planting dates, which will help you predict yields. Uh, you can do what's called crop masking. So if you have a lot of high resolution pictures, you can do machine learning and tell your computer to learn to ignore. Uh, those pixels that are not the crop you're interested in insuring. So there's a number of technological things you can do uh, to improve the accuracy. But again, at this stage of development, I think it's worthwhile to make sure we ground truth them. So in the case I mentioned of Tanzania, we got some data, and we went through literally thousands uh, with a lot of computer programming. We went through thousands of options in terms of crop masking, in terms of planting tape detection, and in terms of using NDVI versus FPAR versus EVI versus leafy area index uh, and, and a bunch of these different kinds of, of measures. And then that design phase allowed us to say, okay, for this growing environment, this appears to be the sweet of uh, this appears to be the, 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 the kind of index formed out of these different measures that gives highest value to the farmer, that is, that maximizes the economic well-being of the farmer and meets a minimum quality standard. I think as we generate more experience, then this kind of take it slow and careful approach will, will give way. Uh, but I, I think we're still at a stage now where I think we're starting to get some ideas about what, what happens. Uh, and what works well, but it's it's still a little bit of a, a work in progress. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, Tara, I wanted to send a question your way from Elon Gilbert, who said uh, that he's interested in knowing more about the char characteristics of farmers using index insurance, guessing that these might be the better off farmers, those already stepping up in agriculture, and participants in value chains, rather than the women, poor, and um, uh, and the, I guess, I'm not sure I fully understand the end of his question, but um, um, yeah, how, how inclusive index insurance can be, and what types of farmers tend to be adopting it? Um, I think what I'm, yeah, I think you're trying to say that it seems like it would be easiest in perhaps 
most immediately adopted by farmers who are relatively well off and already well connected into various value chains um, and or other kinds of uh, opportunities. And I think that, and Michael and Jen, please do chime in, I think that's probably in large part correct depending on the design of the insurance product. So for many of the projects we have tested, such as for cotton farmers in West Africa, that's obviously a relatively integrated value chain. And the, the access to that product is limited and targeted. Uh, on the other hand, as we think about the potential for integrating agricultural index insurance more as a social safety net triggered by uh, an index, and especially in cooperation with the government, I think that has a pot potential to speed up and increase access, perhaps improve targeting for at least uh, social protection assistance in the event of a, an emergency or a shock uh, compared to if a shock occurs and then, you know, ex post governments or donors or others are trying very hard to find who, uh, who is suffering and how to get them the money. I think having that as an automated system could potentially be more inclusive. Um, in that regard. Michael, Jen? Yeah, thanks, Tara. This is Jen, just to add on, and I, I'm not sure you mentioned this um, program specifically by name. If you did, I apologize, but um, one example of this is the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program, which um, is supported by the government of Kenya and targets vulnerable pastoralists specifically. So while um, premiums that are paid fully by the farmer may um, attract uh, farmers that are maybe higher up in the value chain or working on cash crops and maybe less vulnerable. There are certainly ways of implementing um, index insurance programs in ag that target the most vulnerable. And this gets back to um, Michael's brief comment on subsidies, which is that um, we need to make sure that these, these programs um, don't hurt people if they're paying for them, but even if it's the government that's supporting them, we still want them to be efficient use of government resources. Um, so the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program is, is an example of an index-based livestock insurance program that is targeted specifically at vulnerable households. Oh, and that uses um, uh, automatic payments through M-Pesa. You don't need to make a claim. The money automatically shows up. So that speaks to the direct disbursement that Tara was mentioning. Uh, great. Thank you, Tara and Jen. Let's move on to a couple of questions on bundling, and I think these are directed at Michael. So Michael Phillips said that many, many farmers simply can't afford the premiums, and there are a lot of governments that can't afford to subsidize it. So are there any farm supply companies that bundle the insurance cost with the cost of inputs, such as seed and fertilizer? And then Kathy Peary said, are financial institutions covering the cost of insurance as part of a bundled package in a loan package? So two different types of bundling options. Is that happening? Um, okay, those are, those are uh, great questions. Uh, <clears throat> so Tara mentioned some work that was done in Ghana on um, what I like to call interlinked credit and insurance. And so that's a very interesting idea because if, if a loan is insured, then perhaps the, the lending institution might be more willing to make the loan, and we see some evidence of that in, the, in the, the work in Ghana. But also, farmers may be more willing to, to take on the loan when the loan is insured. So uh, there, there's, there's many instances of farmers who may have a contract available to them but in terms of prudentially managing their own risk, particularly risks to collateral assets, uh, having, uh, having insurance uh, available to them makes them more willing. And Terra, a great example of that is the work Terra alluded to that was originally carried out in Mali and is now being scaled up by Sofitech, the, the largest cotton company in, in Burkina Faso. In Mali, we were able to, to do a randomized controlled trial. And these were farmers that were being begged by uh, uh, the same Dete, the local cotton company in Mali, were being begged to plant more cotton and finance was available. But farmers were prudentially managing their own risk because they knew that even though it was a joint liability loan with, with their neighbors, they knew that if they didn't repay, if they were unable to repay because of a crop failure, 
uh, their share of the loan, their neighbors weren't going to be happy with them. And in fact, neighbors tended to take away each other's plows uh, and bicycles and kitchen tables. So sort of local collateralizations and farmers were extremely cautious. And, and the proof of that without insurance, and then when the insurance came along, we saw this roughly 33% increase in farmer investment. Uh, so nothing changed for these farmers, the, the opportunities were there, but then that was an interlinked credit and insurance product. And so when farmers knew the loans were insured, they actually invested substantially more. So if you, if you sort of do the arithmetic on that, which we've done in some papers and there's some briefs on this, if you're interested, um, you know, basically farmers were giving up approximately 25% of their potential income every year in order to manage risk. And by giving them a new insurance option, they were more willing to make more investments because they felt like their, their, their families and their collateral assets uh, were safer. So I think bundling of credit and insurance can make the proposition, can make the loan proposition uh, uh, better for the lender, but also importantly can make it better uh, for the borrower. Uh, bundling with inputs is also a great idea, and it's sort of related because, and this is actually the project I mentioned briefly in Tanzania and Mozambique. We, in that case, we have a bundle. We have a bundle of improved maize seeds. They're actually drought tolerant maize seeds, uh, which are not drought proof but are drought tolerant. The drought tolerant maize seeds are bundled well, with an index insurance product. So. Uh, the prior harvest in Tanzania in our study areas, roughly 50% of the farmers had a terrible drought, uh, and those who had the insured maize seeds actually got uh, replacement maize seeds for use this year. So we're actually just about to launch the end-line study for that, but we're anticipating that the insurance of uh, having maize, insured maize seeds is going to allow those farmers to continue their investment in these in these higher quality and partially the risk mitigating seeds. I think farmers find it very attractive when the insurance is tied into a specific uh, yield increasing input because it, it just makes the whole thing much more concrete. Uh, and this comes, there's a lot of work in what's called behavioral economics. People are much more willing to insure things that they already have. In this case, the farmer has the money that she's going to invest in May seeds. They're much more willing to insure things they have than things that they don't have, which is like, well, maybe next year's income will be lower or higher. So I think bundling is really important. The third thing I will mention, and this I don't know that having been done, but in, when you get into the into organized value chains, if you're talking cotton, you're talking uh, cacao, you can think of a number of, of products. Um, you know, someone, the companies that are part of the downstream companies in the value chains have a huge amount to benefit from increased output. Uh, and so if you ask yourself, you know, if farmers are restricting their production away as a way of managing risk, who's going to benefit if the farmer has insurance and if the farmer therefore increases production. Uh, in, in the case of cotton, it's clearly the, the farmer is going to benefit from producing more. That's the 25% income increase I mentioned. But the cotton companies are also going to benefit because they make their money on the throughput of, of processing that cotton and selling it on the world market. So something we haven't, that I at least can't think of an example of, but, but I think would be really interesting to explore, is if you have a high quality index insurance contract farmers have confidence in it, increase their investment, then the, there's a real material interest of the, of the downstream intermediary processor in that. And, and there's certainly a case to be made to think about uh, sharing the cost of that insurance contract between the processor uh, and the farmer herself. Kara, did you want to add anything or shall we move on to another question? Um, I just want to add briefly, um, because this has come up in the chat window, and I think it's an important note, is that for these kinds of bundled interventions, whether it's with a credit product or improved feed or just regular feed, I think it's really important to, to make sure that the farmer is aware of what's happening to ensure that they are aware that the insurance is attached to that loan, to ensure that farmers are aware how that insurance payment will be distributed, whether it will go first to the bank and then to them, or first to them and they can use it how they want. 
presumably to repay the bank, that needs to be very clear to the farmers ahead of time. Otherwise, if it happens in a way that farmers did not anticipate, it could really distort one. I, I have. I just have general concerns about that if farmers don't know what they're buying or how it will work um, with regard to that particular product. But also, it can distort the market. It can make farmers angry at how, and rightfully so, angry at how it happened if they did not think it was happening that way. So making sure that that evidence is clear and that farmers understand that is important. And then with bundled products, uh, one thing I've observed in certain interventions is that if the, if the insurance product is marketed with the seed and included in the seed packet, but there is additional action needed from the farmer, either to make a claim or to enroll in the insurance product, if that's not well explained, then farmers may not know they're insured or think they're insured, but they haven't actually enrolled, et cetera, et cetera. So making sure that those things are very, very clear whenever you're bundling. And there is some information about this in the 3D uh, client value assessment tool in terms of ways on that checklist to make sure that farmers, one, know that they're insured, and two, understand how they are insured. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left for questions. And so uh, I ask the presenters to be relatively brief with your answers so that we can try and get through at least perhaps three more questions. Um, and I'd also like to call out the fact that we've put up our ending polls on the screen. And so these are always helpful uh, for our participants to answer. Um, let us know uh, some information about what you got from the webinar today. Uh, that would be very helpful. And you can also see on the top left uh, my email address and uh, Kristen Oplanik's email address. She is the uh, activity manager for MarketLinks. Um, so you're welcome to reach out to us anytime with further comments. All right. So, um, Michael, we had a relatively short question from Michael Abrahams. Does a lack of sufficient historic weather data impact efficient insurance pricing? No, so I know that being brief is, is, is pointed at me, so I'll try. Um, <laughs> lack of sufficient data along, you know, along a series of data going back in time is a problem for insurance pricing. Um, and weather data is often problematic uh, for that reason. Um, as I've mentioned already, I'm, I'm a kind of I'm, I'm sort of from experience beginning to think we really need to look not at an input uh, measure like rainfall or even meteorological data, but actually plant growth measures. The satellites that can be used to estimate NDVI have actually been flying around since the early 1980s. The 1980 satellites were fairly uh, low resolution. But since the early 2000s, so going back, uh, you know, 18, 19 years now, we have for the entire globe, we have, uh, we, we have uh, fairly high resolution. So fa by fairly high resolution, I mean uh, 250 meter by 250 meter pixel resolution information available. So that's about six hectares. So that's saying you can get a measure of, a plant, of, of plant growth for each six hectare plot uh, going back almost 20 years, which actually is more than adequate for pricing insurance. Thank you, Michael. Let's see. Um, another question came in from uh, Talapa, who said that the index insurance yearly threshold, uh, is it decided by the insurance provider? or state actors or farmers with the participation of the insurance provider? In a nutshell, who decides what a bad year is and where that threshold is set? Is it okay if I speak to that one? Sure, that sounds great. Sure. Uh, I think the best way to do this, um, you know, I mean, you can consider options. So you can have higher and lower thresholds. The trade-off, of course, is you know, if we, you could imagine a, an insurance contract that pays every time uh, there's any loss whatsoever, that gets to be a very expensive uh, a contract. So there's a trade-off between degree of coverage protection and, and how expensive the contract is. Uh, when we began our work in Mali some years ago, we held a series of focus group with representatives of farmer organizations. And the farmer organizations were able to tell us when our cotton yields go below, I think the number was roughly 700 to 750 kg of cotton per hectare, they said, when our yields hit that level, we are in, 
uh, we are in deep doo-doo. That is, we really have trouble uh, paying off our bills, trouble with our families, uh, and, and things just really start falling apart. So based on that information from farmers, we put together a contract that would pay off at that level. And that turned out to be a, a kind of a reasonably uh, priced level as well. So you can, you know, it's, it's certainly flexible. And I think part of a good design stage is to understand the degree of uh, degree of protection that farmers want and what they're what they're willing to pay for. Again, you can, in principle, imagine different levels of coverage and letting farmers select the coverage that they that they want. Thank you, Michael. Um, another question came in from uh, Stuart Collis and was directed at you, Michael. Uh, Stuart asked, can you speak to the level of interest from insurance companies and underwriters to work with the types of data being discussed here? What are the challenges to convincing them that these are viable approaches? Yeah. I think insurance, I think in, because of, as I mentioned to an earlier question, the satellite data has been around for a while. I, I haven't experienced uh, doing a number of these projects. I haven't experienced any reluctance on the in part of insurance companies um, to uh, to rely on satellite-based measures because the data is there and it comes in reliably in most cases on an almost daily basis. Um, so that's that's not been a problem. I mean, the first project we did in uh, the Ibli project in northern Kenya, the insurance company said, uh, what if the satellite goes dark or falls out of the sky? So we had to come up with a, a backup satellite and there there is redundancy in the system. So. Uh, and that actually did happen. The original satellite we were using did go dark, and we had to sort of switch over. But the, so that was manageable. That, so that's not been a big problem. Even the audit rule uh, that I described, um, that actually went through with, a, I won't bother to name names, but it went through a local insurance, two local insurance companies, and as well as an international reinsurance company. And they accepted the statistical calculations that were made based on the probability that an audit would occur. And again, as I said, that was then incorporated into the actual insurance contract and into the insurance premium. So I found that that, that actually uh, insurance companies are, are pretty open to working with this data precisely because it's, it, it's, it's, it's quite reliable. Great, thank you, Michael. Uh, Tara, I was hoping to address a question to you from James Woolley, who said, I would like to know about the experience uh, with index insurance in countries affected by recurrent droughts and also frequent hurricanes and floods. It seems already difficult to design this tool for a single risk, and they're wondering uh, how good it can be for a combination of complex risks. Is that something you can address? I can't address, but it's going to seem a lot like I'm trying not to answer your question, and I apologize in advance for that. I, I think you're absolutely right that addressing a multitude of very different risks can be very, very difficult. Um, I do think that the first step is to really, anytime we go into a new area and we're thinking about developing a product for farmers or pastoralists, we think about what we try to do an assessment to really understand the risks they face and to understand whether those risks are something that farmers tend to share together or whether they tend to be idiosyncratic risks, such as maybe fires or something like that, that might affect a couple of farmers and not a community of farmers. Um, so that's the first step in terms of thinking about each of the risks that farmers face and whether or not they affect random farmers or huge numbers of farmers. And then once you have that, simultaneously doing an assessment of data availability and whether or not a reliable index can be created for those risks that you've identified. And then testing the yield history data or to see is there actually anything that can re reliably predict those things. And I think it potentially if you found a multitude of indices that could cover a multitude of different threats, they could conceivably be combined or separately sold uh, to cover a broader swath of the risks that people face. But initially, those are my first thoughts. Michael or Jen, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, if I could jump in, I think that's a great question. So 
to me, this is the importance of trying to measure an output rather than an input. So if you can actually measure plant growth, then you're, you're, you're measuring, you're, you're, it's basically a multi-peril kind of insurance. So I mentioned a project in, that we did in Tanzania. That actually came about because initially uh, World Vision was working with a dry day index. In the very first year, they implemented the dry day index, which was only to pay out when rainfall was scarce. Uh, farmers had a flood. <laughs> and so farmers lost everything, the index didn't pay, and, and everybody was extremely unhappy. It was, when we looked down from the sky with satellites, you know, a field, a, a rice field that's been flooded and washed out, uh, that shows up, right? That shows up as very poor plant growth. So that's the nice thing about trying to get it at plant growth measures is that in principle, a flood or a hailstorm or uh, a drought, any of these things which are very different kind of climatic events, but all of which can, you know, damage plant growth, then in principle, uh, you, you can cover it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tara and Michael. Uh, well, we have had a number of other questions that have come in that we've been saving, and I'm sorry that we won't be able to get to every one of them on the webinar today, uh, but we will send them to the presenters to look through and see if we can address some of your additional questions through a blog post on AgriLinks. And so uh, we remind you that this has been recorded today, so be on the lookout for an email with the recording, the transcript, uh, transcript of the chat with all the great questions in it, and a few other key resources. So I would like to uh, extend a sincere thank you uh, to our presenters, uh, Jen, Michael, and Tara, and to the members of the Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project who have supported the webinar today. Uh, and most importantly, a huge thank you to you, our attendees, for attending AgriLink's webinars, for participating in the chat box, and for really being the reason that we continue